everyone. It is with great excitement that I introduce someone who is a role model, an iconic role model to me, and certainly to many in the industry. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Ted Schillis, the futurist of Paramount Pictures. Ted, the floor is yours. Thanks, Molly. Nice to see everyone and be in the same virtual space with everyone. I recognize some names of some friends there that uh, I know well and uh, spend a lot of time with. Um, the, uh, I, was, I was watching some of Yannicka's talk and I loved the way she was working the, the Zoom backgrounds and just used a looping video and it was very cool. Uh, my version is just welcome to my little rec room in my house, um, which is just one of the places that I sort of live in this odd world that uh, kind of intersects with what I do in the in the pseudo real world that we're all in now. Um, you'll you'll forgive me for, for wearing the hat. Uh, what's under it is uh, basically my my Tiger King inspired haircut uh, or lack thereof for the last couple months that um, I won't uh, shock you all to, to see what's going on under there, but uh, it's, it's sort of terrifying. Um, so I thought uh, since you guys have been at it for three days and you've had a lot of uh, different uh, speakers and covering lots of different things, um, I would um, maybe just do a little casual discussion of some of the stuff that I've been doing and involved in. Um, I would love to see, I don't know how many people can turn on their video at the same time if they're allowed to do that or not, but it'd be interesting to, to see everybody's face as opposed to their names. I don't know. Um, some people can. Uh, we, we've got Paul Dubovic here. Uh, and Robin Rowe and many others, um, but not everyone can because it's a Zoom webinar. So, but you've got some people showing yeah. now. For just you. nice to see. Just nice to see people when you're when you're talking. You always like want to see if they're responding at all. Hey, Paul. Hello. <laughs> um, so, um, Paul, let's and I encourage people uh, that are the panelists to turn on your cameras so that. Um, uh, uh, um, Ted can see you and, uh, and as he uh, communicates. There's a lot more people than this, but these are the people on the speaker panel. So take it away. Oh, good. Yeah, I was just, just curious to see people's faces associated with the names. Um, so uh, it's interesting because today, like I, I imagine you, a lot of you are in the same world that I am very comfortable with video chatting like this. Uh, I've, I've done this for years. Uh, I've done plenty of virtual sessions. Uh, I do them on computer screens like this. I've do, done them in VR. I've done them in mixed reality um, on a pretty regular basis before this was all happening. And now on a tremendously monstrous basis, I did a four hour session today on video um, with a strategic team that working on a big project. Um, we took three breaks during it, uh, but it was completely viable and it worked fine. Um, and, uh, I've uh, managed to navigate my spectrum internet and with very long hold times and just not willing to give up, managed to have them um, upgrade my service to the point what they, about half of what I'm paying for now, as opposed to about one tenth of where it started. So if you're in that issue where you're not getting good enough bandwidth, you, the squeaky wheel gets answered. You have to complain and you have to say, I use this for work and you need to give me what I'm paying for or else I'm not paying for it kind of thing. And they will, they will react. And of course you're sensitive to the fact that all of our friends and neighbors are all on our home internets all day long. Um, so we're, we're aware of it, but trust me, if you uh, pitch a fit, uh, now I'm getting my 400 megabits and my 20 to 25 up. Whereas before I was getting like one to two up. And I see some people nodding their heads that they've maybe accomplished the same thing. So hopefully my signal is coming through. Okay. Cause they, I did a speed test this morning and it was all, it was all jamming and working well. Um, so maybe the, the, the first way to, to start what I'll talk about is I'll talk about this piece of my house, the environment that I'm in. Um, if you look behind me, I basically cleared out, this is kind of the kid's playroom, and I cleared out a whole bunch of floor space here because um, I'm, I, I'm sure like a lot of you, I'm, I'm sort of like, in the best health condition I've been in the last 30 years because I take long walks every day. Uh, I do my cardio uh, and weight stuff, lightweight stuff, and I do VR exercise every day. So I have two quests here. I've got two riffs here in this room. I've got a Magic Leap. I've got a couple of prototype headsets. I have a HoloLens. Um, 
so I, I kind of live in this like half real, half virtual world anyway, right? So I can kind of go anywhere, do anything. Um, if I need to take a little break from the kids and the kitchen table office, I can pop into Beat Saber. I'm uh, already hooked on something called Supernatural, which some of you may have heard of. It's my friend Chris Milk's um, exercise, sort of Peloton-esque uh, kind of program. It has a lot of sort of uh, tenants in the same sort of um, mechanics as Beat Saber, but it's, it's designed with a workout person that sort of talks you through it, and, and it's actually designed for exercise. So you do squatting and all that. I do a couple of VR boxing games, VR boxing simulators almost every day. Um, and I can tell you that it works like you, you, number one, if you want to lose weight, you can lose weight, you can get in better shape and it's fun. Um, so, so what I did is I basically just sort of pushed all the kids stuff out of the way and cleared about a 10 by 10 area to do all that in the back room of my house, in the front room, which is my wife's office. She's actually away, which is a whole nother long story. Um, I have a full vibe set up in there. So I've been playing half-life Alex. I don't know if any of you have, have had a chance to play that yet, but it's pretty exceptional. And um, it's, it's really done a nice job of showing that uh, we continue to make progress in these mediums. We continue to up our game in terms of the quality of the work that's been uh, created. And uh, that game is not only a creative success, it's also an economic success. So if you track some of the business side of this, it's already cracked 40 million in revenue, um, which for the hyper segmented market of VR is, is quite good. Uh, and it's, on, it's probably on its way to making over 100 million. Um, so way to go, right? Good, good on Valve's um, sort of state of the union for, for, for continuing to, to believe that this medium has legs in, in various ways. Um, in terms of uh, what we are doing from a studio standpoint, and a lot of you that have seen me give speeches and things where I've talked at, at various conferences and stuff, I still am very, very bullish on mixed reality, um, on wearable mixed reality, uh, and uh, a big big part of my thesis is I believe that there is a logical evolution to this device. Um, and this device has changed media in massively fundamental ways. So I work for a very large uh, media organization, right? Viacom CBS is the parent organization of Paramount. Um, no one would question that. But um, I think it was, it was maybe two years ago or three years ago at CES, after a somewhat sparky conversation with a lot of good debate and a very, very large crowd, um, they were questioning a lot about new mediums and new ways to look at things. And I said, okay, I think it's all fine. We can debate this till the cows come home. But if I look at an audience that made a trip out to Vegas to go to a conference like CES, and I hold this device up, would anybody in this audience legitimately tell me that this is the last form factor of your daily use device that you will ever have? Because if you think that's true, then you probably shouldn't be at CES. And everybody sort of paused for a second, took a deep breath and went, well, yeah, I guess you're right. Like this is probably not the end of the road, right? Um, so, so I'm working a lot on that with partners, uh, both teeny startups, well overfunded startups, which we could talk about some of the drama that's going on in that world, uh, and very, very large tech giants that all believe that there is a next evolution of the visual compute system that will not just be a flat screen. Um, and I think what's interesting, and, and by the way, if you want to do questions at some point, um, I see people commenting about spectrum on this side and so forth. Um, if, um, if people want to ask questions about this stuff, I'm happy to stop and break in and we can do questions. I'll let Molly kind of guide us how you want to do it. But I think maybe uh, a piece of this puzzle that I think is probably valuable for this audience to talk about and debate and think about is if we think about from the time we were little kids and our grandparents and our great grandparents and the time that our kids were born, some of us maybe have grandkids were born, um, think about how much of your time is spent in some sort of rectangular flat format, right? So think about like, let's call it well over 90% of everything that hangs in a museum other than sculpture, right? Think about every sort of TV thing you've ever watched for the most part is either a square or a rectangle. Think about every book you've read, right? Think about every map you've opened. Think about every device you've looked at. For many, many, many generations, it's all been bounded by this box. And our brains and our psychology has been built around that, right? For many, many, many cycles. So part of the reason that people 
find a certain critique about virtual reality and mixed reality and well, it's not happening, it's not happening fast enough, we can't find good use cases for it. I don't believe any of that's true. I believe that there's a natural evolution to this. But when you boil it down to a really interesting piece of the puzzle, when we understand, because I'm doing it right now and all of you are doing it right now, we're all looking at rectangles. In fact, I'm looking at a whole bunch of rectangles inside a rectangle like you all are, right? It's so purveyant in our brain culture that taking a step out of that into something where we are not bounded by that rectangle anymore, where the screen tracks with us and finds what we are looking at and understands that, whether that's completely obfuscated in the world of VR or a digital layer in the world of mixed reality, it's a gigantic change in our culture, in our understanding, in our learning, and it cannot be underestimated how difficult it will be to achieve that change. I would think that, and I, I think Paul, you would probably agree with me on this, that arguably the, the amount of success that VR and now mixed reality is starting to show is actually outpacing what we that study this stuff would have believed how quickly it would have happened. Um, there are so many foibles to this and so many things outside of just the, pro the, the raw technology, just the humanity of it all, the big change of wearing something instead of putting it on a desk or holding it, and the big change of starting to understand that there are other kinds of media experiences other than this um, is so monstrous that you cannot underestimate how much effort it will take to start to tip those scales in the other direction, right? And you can look at the largest companies of the world, the largest tech giants, all commenting very publicly about their belief in this next visual compute system. Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Google, all putting their money where their mouth is, all very publicly dedicating billions upon billions of dollars, right? Not hundreds of millions, but billions of dollars against trying to figure out what's next. Is there something next? Um, so I think we all believe that there is something next and we're, and we're in the world of trying to find our way to get there. Um, I'll bring up this last piece of the puzzle and then maybe I'll, I'll open it for questions if you want. Um, I think an interesting piece of the economic pie of understanding when you get a piece of hardware right and how long and, and how much effective iteration it takes to get it right. But when you get it right, you can have something that the economics are staggering on. So who here, I guess by show of hands or text or whatever, has uh, a set of the, Air, the AirPods, the Apple AirPods, whether it's the first generation or the second generation? I presume a lot of you do, right? No one's raising their hand. I'm sure we all do, right? Yeah, okay. So, so those, those AirPods, right? If you were to ask the question, if Apple decided to split that off as its own separate business, right? just selling ear pods tied to an iPhone. Would you be shocked to hear that it, all, in and of itself, it was just selling that product, it would be the 32nd largest company on planet Earth. It's kind of shocking. It's freaking earphones for God's sake, right? But the valuation of just that business unit at Apple is close to $160 billion now. It's like, it's bigger than GE, it's bigger than GM, it's bigger than all the US automakers combined pre-COVID. It's half the valuation of Intel for God's sake. It's bigger than Disney's valuation right now. All because they kept working on it and working on it and working on it and realizing that people did want that product but they didn't want the creepy Bluetooth headset board product that people had that no one liked. They found the right style cues, they found the right use case and they built their Trojan horse strategy around, let's first remove the, the headphone jack and let's make it a little harder. You gotta use the lightning cable if you wanna plug in a thing and then you gotta get an adapter for the charger and the whole thing. But let's make really good refined earphones that are fashion forward, super comfortable, viable, and it's a gigantic business for Apple, right? That's the ears where our sound system works. Think about how exponentially larger the business opportunity is when we get the I part right, right? When we get it here. So that's sort of my general thesis on, on, on how I kind of go about the world and what I think about and what this very large media company pays me to think about. Um, so I thought that would be a, a good way to maybe end your, end your session.
Now what? Now what happens? <laughs> We're, we're getting Molly. I am. I'm right here. Uh, sorry, I, it's almost the end of the program. And so the final, final frontier things are coming on, Ted. And I am so excited to ask you a few questions here um, before we uh, introduce our next uh, speaker. So, uh, um, Ted, you really are on the forefront and a predictor of the future. Uh, I have to ask my question. It's my own personal question, but when are we going to have an Obi-Wan Kenobi we can beam into the palm of our hands as a hologram that's AI enabled that can help us with anything, anywhere, anytime? So um, we're pretty damn close. Um, one of the tiny little startups that I'm an investor in, Shari Redstone is an investor in, and the late Paul Allen is an investor in, is a very small volumetric capture company out of San Diego. Um, that is doing remarkable things in terms of hyper photorealistic capture. So it's different than what you might have seen from some of the bigger companies doing volumetric where everything kind of still looks like a game engine asset, doesn't yeah. look photoreal. These guys are focused on photoreal. And we're doing some stuff now that lives on the iOS platform and takes advantage of the AR kit uh, stuff um, where we're doing kind of a, I, I would call it like a, like if there's 3D and there's 2D and there's two and a half D, for those that live in the VFX world and understand it, this is sort of like the two and a half D version of volumetric yeah. where we're doing a front facing volumetric that is easily runnable on an iPhone or an iPad. And I have examples. I can show them to you if anybody just, if yes, you want to tell me, I can, I can, you know, we can get you on test flight if you want to test it, or I can show you some video examples. Um, mm -hmm. We're able to bring in live full size performers like into your living room. And today we do it, through a, like a magic window lens, right? We hold up an iPhone and we can see it uh, and it works remarkably well. And in the near future, as we wear a device that's fully spatial, we'll have full fidelity, full size. Um, so you, you'll get the Princess Leia or the Obi-Wan Kenobi effect. So we're doing it today and it's working. Oh, Ted, that's great news. Um, uh, can you tell us your uh, 100 year prediction as the futurist there at Paramount for this entertainment world, I'd love to hear it. Hundred years is pretty rough. I, I you know, I, I kind of tap out at ten. That seems okay. To be nice well, how control. about ten? <laughs> well, uh, let's. We can start with ten. Then I guess we can go to hundred if you want. Um, I think in the way I the way I look to, the way I like to look at this is if you project backward, you can project forward, right? So like a really good futurist is a it's a bit of a scam, right? Because what a really good futurist is, is actually a pastist. You study the past to extrapolate to the future. So if we look back 10 years ago at the kind of devices we were using, the kind of infrastructure we had, and then we look at today, and then we look at 10 years in the future, you can have a pretty good bet that the devices we use today are going to get faster, much more nimble. And as to I was making the point before, um, much more logically, ergonomically designed to where our visual system is, right? Last time I checked, our visual system is not in our pocket, right? So the fact, there's a, there's a, there's a really odd statistic on how many times you take your phone out of your pocket to look at it in a day. Um, and it's, it's like a stunning number. And I think the number of how many times we touch our physical iPhone or Android phone a day is close to 2,700 times a day. Right. So if you think about that statistic, knowing that I've got to get it up in front of my eyes over and over and over and over again in a day's use case, the next evolution of that certainly makes sense when we can get the technology light enough, nimble enough and smart enough. And a big part of that is understanding where we are with edge compute and cloud compute and evolving that in such significant ways that the device can be effectively weightless on our head because there'd be such limited processing and the visual components on the, what, on the wearable, but everything else will be coming in from the world's biggest computer sitting up in the sky, right? So the beginnings of that are 5G. By the time in 2030, we get to 7G or 8G, right? Where we're moving multi-gig speed around with ease, um, then you're gonna have that world. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting world to look at. Uh, in terms of a hundred years out, um, 
Wow, I mean, I guess I could be quite dystopian saying, I wonder if we'll even be here a hundred years out, right? The way things are going right now, yeah. there's a chance that that's a, that's a terrible thought to just like think about. Let's hope we can, can figure it all out. Um, I think an interesting sort of moment in time that a lot of people I know are reflecting on is while we're all dealing with the consequences of this and some are very dire and drastic and awful, the planet is healing itself. And yeah. there's a wonderful little silver lining that's going on with nobody driving and no next day delivery of services and no, you know, all the things that we forget how comfortable and easy we accepted everything, but underneath it all, there's a massive footprint uh, that's very damaging to the ecology of the planet, right? So taking a little breather from that, maybe not the worst thing in the world, certainly the consequences now are terrible, but if you look at it in the bigger picture, in the broader picture, um, maybe every 50 to 75 years, we got to go through something like this to keep, to keep the planet that we have with us for our great grandkids and their kids, you know? Quite well taken. A lot of silver linings happening right now, certainly. Yeah. Um, and a final uh, question, Ted, is um, one that a lot of the trailblazers have been asked. What advice do you have for the inventors and entrepreneurs out there uh, that may be struggling with challenges, struggling getting resources, uh, but believe completely in their ideas? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question, right? Because part of it is the keep exploring, keep learning, keep challenging yourself. Don't be afraid of the naysayers and the people that say, I don't get it. I don't think it's a thing. Don't do it. Um, I've had three successful business things that I've done that all started with pushing a big rock up a big hill and people going, you're, you're insane. It's never going to be anything. I don't know why you're wasting your time. I don't know why you're bothering. Right. And they all turned out pretty okay. Um, playing devil's advocate, surrounding yourself with people that are smart, that are well-intentioned and that will look at something and give you their perspective, honestly on it, whether it's what you want to hear or not, you, you should put appropriate weight to that. And I think a lot of people get stuck in a, I am so focused on this idea and I think it's a good idea and I'm not gonna to listen to anybody tell me anything about whether it's really a good idea or not, or maybe a slight modification should be a good idea to this. Um, I think that level of dogma can hurt you and, and you can get yourself caught in this endless loop of, I know I've got this right. Um, because like in our world, it's all about tweaking and collaboration and reworking the equation, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the minute you think you really got it right, you probably don't. And it's just worth listening to people that have been through it. So if you can find mentors, like I have great mentors in my life and I continue to have them to this day. Can, that, you, can, you, Ted, can you share a little bit about your mentors, either who they are or what type of people sure. they are and how they've impacted your yeah, um, one, of, one of my first mentors was a guy named John Apt when I was uh, still doing production. I'd done a little startup um, that was related to, to high def technology in the analog days. This shows you my age a little bit. Um, of, I believed that there would be a, a, a logical replacement to film capture for certain applications. And I was a very early advocate of that. Um, so we did a startup that was related to that technology which led me through a, a long convoluted story, but led me through to an interesting juncture where the person that was building that core technology came out of this wonderful little hamlet up in Northern California called Grass Valley. And if you know anything about TV and broadcast engineering, you know Grass Valley. If you're a Star Wars fan, you know Grass Valley because when, they, when the Death Star blows up the planet, they used a Grass Valley TV switcher and the, um, the, the fader bar from a TV switcher is the thing that he uses to blow up the planet. Um, yeah. That's a Grass Valley switcher and it's, it still lives to this day. Um, so one of the key engineers there had started a company and they were building all this broadcast infrastructure gear and Apple reached out to them because they were trying to figure out how to start to use computers for professional video applications. And he reached out to me, he's like, you know a lot about Macs, right? You're like into Apple culture and stuff. We don't know nothing about that. Would you consider like helping us run this division and helping us figure out desktop video with Apple? So I was like, sure, that sounds like an interesting gig. Little did I know that I would be sort of like turned into this world where I had the office in Cupertino and an office in LA. I would fly back and forth three times a week on the Southwest bus for those that 
for the days when I used to fly all the time. Now it's been a long time since I've been on a plane. Um, to two months now, which is kind of crazy for me anyway. Um, and, and he, this guy, John, was the salt of the earth. And he looked out for me in so many ways and was so influential. And I, like, the stories I could tell you about our trials and tribulations with Apple and how much we learned and like, the, just the, the insanity of it all, trying to figure out to build something new. And we did accomplish it and it was very successful and it really started an industry in that, in that fashion. And then years later, uh, when I was getting ready to help launch this crazy thing called the Red Camera, with this wonderfully insane billionaire that, that had these great ideas and lots of capital, but nobody really knew how to do this. John gave me the best advice at all. And he's like, look, you should try this. Like, what's the worst that could happen? And trust me, if it all crashes and burns, we'll look out for you and we'll find a job for you. Like, we'll, we'll give you some kind of parachute. So like, take it on, see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? And trust me, we got your back, right? He was one of my, my first real mentors, and I will never forget that. That was That's a big, great. big moment in my life. Um, Jack, yep. Thank you so much. I could literally talk to you all day, all night, because you have such wisdom. You see the future. You're such a visionary. We're so glad you could join us uh, for our final, final talks here, Trailblazer Talks. And um, I'm going to say thank you and stop the recording now and uh, get ready for our final grand finale trailblazer uh, talker. And, um, and yeah, thank you so much, Ted. And My pleasure, it was fun. I, I look Good forward talk, to- Ted. Thanks, Chris. Oh, oh Dan's here. Uh, do, you know, uh, do you know Dan, Maeve? Yeah. Uh, I do know Dan. Oh yeah, hi Dan. <laughs> Dan's- <Yeah>. Cityscape. <laughs> he's getting ready for his talk if you okay, want- great. I will listen in. Yeah, okay, Shut the hell up and listen in now. <laughs>